Hello friends, welcome to the session for recall questions from the subject community medicine from NEET PG 2022. A small disclaimer, uh, all the questions that I'm going to discuss in this video session are taken from the recall from the students. We do not intend to replicate any question from any exam across the country. Our main motive right now is to discuss the topic or the or the content of the question rather than to replicate the question. So in case you find any discrepancy, that's okay. We are going to discuss just the topic of the question or the topic of the or the theme of the questions. So let's take on the first MCQ beta, which of the following steps is not included in the steps approach by the WHO. So WHO had started a steps approach. What is this? this the WHO had started a steps approach to prevent any non-communicable diseases or the chronic diseases. Steps stands for the stepwise approach to surveillance. Stepwise approach to surveillance. So under the stepwise approach to surveillance, there are three categories of a questionnaire and the first parameter, first category in the questionnaire is regarding the physical measurements. Second in line we have is the behavioral measurement and third we also have is the biochemical measurement. So these are the three parts of the steps approach questionnaire by the WHO to prevent the non-communicable diseases in the country or in the globe overall. So the best answer that you would like to mark over here is the therapeutic assessment that is not a part of the steps approach. We do have physical, biochemical and the behavioral measurement. Next question is which of the following agency provides seeds and manure in applied nutrition program in the schools? So options were CARE, UNDP, UNICEF and WHO. What is the, all this CARE, UNDP? CARE stands for Cooperative for Assistance and Relief Everywhere. UNDP is United Nations Development Program. UNICEF, United Nations International Children Emergency Fund. Please note it is an emergency fund. Do not confuse it with educational fund. So and WHO is World Health Organization. So this question is it's actually an historical it's a historical mcq with having less relevance for the date today what happened was that in 1963 the applied nutrition program applied nutrition food and nutrition program was started by the unicef in india and in many developing countries across the world they started with the applied nutrition program what was the concept behind applied nutrition program it was to improve the nutritional status of the school children of the school going children so that will actually promote the nutrition in children and that will actually promote literacy among the children and also to promote uh, nutrition in the pregnant and lactating females and lactating females so how would you do that so one was to give them some foods and also another important aspect of the applied nutrition program was to inculcate the habit of uh, of uh, having kitchen gardens or to improve local farming within the schools so children will be more adapted and they'll be more uh, in liaison with the with growing their own food products rather than uh, taking synthetic food products so promoting production that was one important thing and protective foods as vegetable and fruit within the schools so to promote them with the kitchen garden or the vegetable garden within the school was one of the main fund of the applied nutrition program it was a big success even today we are being uh, we are following this applied nutrition uh, program concepts even today in the schools then 16 1963 it was started only in the state of Tamil Nadu and Odisha and 1973 within 10 years it was spread across the pan India so the applied nutrition program please note it was a program under the UNICEF United Nations International Children Emergency Fund there is a separate program 1973 there was a special nutrition program this special nutrition program is also was also started by the unicef that was also started by the unicef but the special nutrition program was to provide the the children school going children with the with the midday meals or to have a separate system called as anganwadi this special nutrition program was later on merged with the icds program so please note that the applied nutrition program is something different it was again by unicef special nutrition program is something different it was again by unicef special nutrition program was um, like amalgamated with icds whereas the applied nutrition program does not exist anymore but yes the concepts are still there under the school health program so the best answer that you would like to mark over here which of the following agency provides seed and manure in the applied nutrition program answer is unicef and the world bank they had been funding that next question which statement refers best to the criteria for starting 
an urban community health center. So caters to a population of 1 to 1.5 lakh, a referral center for 2 to 3 primary health centers, no sub-district or district hospitals if they are present in the areas. It has a 100 bed facility in the metropolitan area, what do you want to mark? So if you just look at the urban healthcare setup that we have in India, urban PHC, urban CHC are two important health facilities. Then at the lower level, we have the AM centers, we have the USHA workers or the urban ASHA workers. MCQs, urban ASHA workers is for 200 to 500 population, urban PHC is for 50,000 population, urban AM center is for 10,000 population and the urban CHC is for 2.5 lakh population. 2.5 lakh population in all cities and 5 lakh population in the metropolitan cities. That is the basic things. Next MCQ can be like how many beds are there. Beta the CHC that is the community health center. It could be a rural CHC or we can have an urban CHC. In case of rural CHC, please make sure that you remember that the total beds in a CHC is roughly more than 30 beds. So they could be 30 to 50 beds. They could be with FRU, without FRU in the rural setup. So FRU stands for the first referral unit, first referral unit. So in case the CHC is working as a first referral unit, they need to have like more than 30 beds up till 50 beds. In case it's not a, a referral unit, so you can have 30 to 40 beds, whatever number. But generally speaking, it is 30 to 50 beds. In case of urban CHC, in any case of urban CHC, non-FRU or FRU, it is almost always taken as a 100 bedded hospital. So now if you understand this, let us come back to the question, which statement refers best to the criteria for stating for starting an urban health community health center? It caters to a population of 1 to 1 and a half uh, lakh. Answer is no, it caters to a population of 2.5 lakh in all cities and 5 lakh in metropolitan cities. That's what we have done. So this is false option. This is false. Referral center for two to three primary uh, health centers. As you see over here, one PHC, PHC is for 50,000 population and one CHC is for 2.5 lakh. So usually it caters for five to seven PHC, not two to three PHC. I am not agreeing with this option. This is wrong. It should have been five to six PHCs. So that is also a false option. Option number C, no sub-district or district hospital are present. That is also false option. How can it be possible that there is no district hospital in the area or the sub-district hospital is not there? This has to be there. Like that, that doesn't make sense at all. It is a 100 bed facility in the metropolitan city that it is not always 100, but it is more than 100. So option D would be taken as the best possible uh, single best answer over here. Option number D. Next question is, how is a broken vial, a vaccine vial disposed of according to the Biomedical Waste 2016 guidelines? So very frequently you get questions from the Biomedical Waste Beta. There is a yellow category, there is a red category, there is a blue category and there is a white category. So what do you dispose of in the yellow category? Very frequently asked MCQs. So anything which is infectious, which include your dressing material, the dressing material, it could be with the HIV blood, without HIV blood, whatever it is, it has to go into the yellow category. Please also note that all the beddings will also go, go into the yellow category. Then is all the expired drugs or the expired medicines along with the cytotoxic waste. They all are disposed of in the yellow category. I would also like to tell you that live vaccines, this can be MCQ, live vaccines unopened unused live vaccines they also are discarded in the yellow category blood and blood products are also discarded in the yellow category blood bags are also discarded in the yellow category frequently asked at mcqs which are confusing to the student next in line is about the red category very frequently you get disturbed by this question like where to dispose of syringe all the syringe which are plastic will go into the red category any gloves it could be nitrile gloves, latex gloves, HIV blood, hepatitis blood, typhoid blood, salmonella blood, cholera blood, no blood, whatever it is, any type of glove has to go into the red category. There is no other category. There is no exception over here. So all the gloves will go into the red category, all the syringes, all the urine bags urine bags, urinary catheters, all the follies tube, everything goes into the red category. Please remember rubber plastic and tube they go into the red category next in line is the blue category blue category is for two things that is unbroken or broken not unbroken it is for broken glass it is for ampules 
it is for ampules, it is for vials, any kind of glass, any broken glass that goes to the blue category and also for the metallic ortho implants. Metallic ortho implants are taken in the blue category. Next in line is the white category. Please note that the sharps, they all go into the white category. Sharps along with metals, they go into the white category. Another could be an exception over here could be the fixed needle syringes. Fixed needle syringes also go into the white category. Another confusing MCQ which can be asked over here is regarding the vacutainers. Please note that vacutainers, they are plastic. Vacu Tainers. I hope you must have worked with the vacuum tainers. They are like vacuum uh, tubes you have for blood samples, right? So the vacuum tainers are disposed of in the uh, red category. But in case the MCQ says, specifically if the MCQ says vacuum tainer with the blood, it goes in the yellow category. That is an exception, okay? So now if you understand this question was pretty straightforward. Broken vaccine vial is disposed of in which category? Answer is a puncture proof blue color bin. Puncture proof blue color bin is for uh, broken glass that is as per the biomedical waste guidelines 2016. The next MCQ is AM has to conduct a vaccination camp in the villages. In the village, she receives two open vials. So now the problem is regarding the open vial. One of the pentavalent vaccine and another of the MR vaccine, measles rubella vaccine. What do you think she is going to do with the vials? Discard the measles rubella and use pentavalent. Use both penta and discard use pentavalent and discard the measles. Use both or discard both. There is something called as beta open vial policy. So what is open vial policy? Open vial policy means that you can use the vaccine till 28 days even if it is open but, but with temperature maintenance. So if the temperature is maintained for a while and in case they are opened, you can reuse that vial or you can use that vial for at least till 28 days. Please note that the open vial policy is not applicable. Do not get confused. Is not applicable to which vaccines. So which vaccines cannot be used till 28 days. The MCQ is very straightforward that the open vial policy is not applicable in what cases it is not applicable in Mera, Rota, Bichara, Jija. Mera stands for measles, rubella. Rota stands for the Rota virus vaccine. Bichara stands for the BCG. Jija stands for the Japanese encephalitis and there is one COVID-19 vaccines also. These vaccines are not used. They are not under the open vial policy so they cannot be used till 28 days they have to be used in the same day on the same session. The measles rubella should be used within 4 to 6 hours. Rotavirus within 4 to 6 hours after opening they should be used within 4 to 6 hours. BCG they should be within 4 to 6 hours. Japanese encephalitis should be used within 2 hours. COVID-19 within 6 to 8 hours of opening you should be using these vaccines. So if you understand this a very simple direct MCQ. So pentavalent is under the open vial policy whereas measles rubella is not. So you are going to use the pentavalent and discard the measles rubella. It's a direct MCQ if you know what is open vial policy. Another question which was asked was uh, the question regarding GSY. So GSY, beta, it's a Janani Suraksha Yojana. In an urban area in the state of Madhya Pradesh, so two MCQs, urban area of Madhya Pradesh, a prima gravida goes for institutional delivery after being motivated by an ASHA worker. What are the benefits that the female is going to receive in terms of the money in rupees under the GSY? GSY stands for the Janani. Suraksha Yojana. Janani Suraksha Yojana, it's a central program, it's a centrally sponsored scheme under which some incentive is given to the mother for institutional delivery. So you should know that there are two broad areas that we are going to talk. Either an area could be urban area or a rural area. Then the area could be a low performing state or a high performing state. So there are some states, these are called as the Bimaru states, B-I-M-A-R-U. Bimaru stands for Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, Uttar Pradesh. These are the big states where there is malnutrition problem. Low birth weight is a big problem. Mother child health indicators are not so nicely doing. So these states are definitely called as the low performing states. 
Along with these Bimaru states, we have another set of six states which include Uttarakhand, Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, Orissa, state of Assam and Jammu Kashmir recently added in year 2020 and 2021. So these states are all called as the, they are taken as the low performing states. So the MCQ was very straightforward. They gave you Madhya Pradesh, which is since long taken as the low performing state. So they gave you the low performing state and they gave you that it is an urban area. In the urban area, what is the incentive we are giving to the female and to the ASHA worker? In the urban areas, we are giving either 600 or 1000. 600 for high performing states, 1000 for low performing state to the mother. And alongside, we are giving ASHA worker also some incentive in the high performing states. It is 400 and low also it is 400. So in the urban area, it is 400 rupees fixed for ASHA and uh, the mother will get either 600 or 1000. In the rural areas, the ASHA is going to get a higher amount of 400, whether low performing, high performing, it is irrespective. But the female is going to get 700 in high performing and 1400 in low performing. So if you know this now, I think the answer is in front of you. It is, was an urban area from Madhya Pradesh. So what are you going to write? It is urban area. So either, uh, uh, either we were giving 600 or 1000. So the best answer over here is 1000 for the mother and 400 for the ASHA worker. Question number two, you are working on a PHC in a PHC, not on a PHC. You are working in a PHC which is situated in a high seismic zone. High seismic means there is more uh, uh, tectonic movements or the plate of the earth are moving. You will do the following for preparedness in case of an emergency. So what are you going to do to prevent the earthquakes? Ses seismic zone means earthquake prone zone. So disaster preparedness by making sure all the financial and other resources are available. Increase the public awareness through campaigns and loudspeakers. Conduct a stimulation, simulation for the disaster and assess the response. Follow the instruction given over phone by or radio by the higher official. So what are you going to do? What do you think? It's a very common sense MCQ. So the first thing, whenever you are talking in terms of the disaster, the best thing that you can do is disaster preparedness. So disaster preparedness is one very important, uh, important activity that you have to make sure that all the resources, all the finances are well in place. Next is you also have to conduct the drills. This is very important to conduct the mock drills. So it is actually going to tell the people what to do when the earthquake comes. Third is important is about the public awareness should be there in terms of the campaigns or the loudspeakers. So of course loudspeaker won't be very uh, good because it's not, uh, it may create some panic in the population. So, but yes, definitely one and three are the definite exercises. Option number four, like following instruction given over four is not, uh, given over phone is not a very good answer because you are the medical officer and you are in charge of the of the disaster response team in the in that particular area so you're not supposed to follow the instruction at that in the in times of emergency but yes uh, i'm not saying that the following instruction is not there but for a disaster preparedness system it is one and three which are very better answers compared to two but one two and three they all come as the single best answer so this is the direct snapshot from the protocol for disaster preparedness by the government of India. So uh, for disaster preparedness for earthquake build in, building should be in accordance with the urban planning regulations. You have to maintain that. Ensure that all clinical uh, electrical and the gas appliances in the houses are connected. They are firmly fixed. Avoid strong objects or materials in high position. Hold family evacuation drills. That is what the option number three was. Ensure that the whole family knows what to do in case of earthquakes and prepare a family emergency kit. So basically speaking, it's all about disaster preparedness. It is about health awareness. So option number one, two and three, they are the best answers. I would like to follow with the option number B over here. That is the correct answer because it takes into account the option number one, two and three, all three. Next MCQ is although many animals are implicated in the spread of rabies, dogs are the most common ones. That is very true. So please note that for rabies, uh, bats are not known to be the spreader of uh, rabies in India. Dogs and cats and all the wild animals, yes, they do spread rabies. Dogs are the most common. We do agree. So anyways, that was the statement. Also, it usually affects the children in developing countries. That is also true. So thank you for telling us. Knowing this, what is the most cost effective and logical way to uh, reduce the incidence of rabies? So this question, again, it is not a medical jargon. It's not containing any medical knowledge. But yes, common sense and public health 
understanding is important over here. So what is the best cost effective and a logical way? Killing all the stray dogs and vaccinate the domestic dogs. What do you think? Killing all the stray dogs. Do you think the PETA or the people for animals, the PFA, they'll leave you? Answer is no. This is absolutely a wrong answer. It's a rubbish choice. Eliminating the stray dogs and vaccinating other dogs, that seems like a decently good option. You should eliminate the stray dogs, not kill all the stray dogs. Increasing the laboratory facilities, that may be true, that's okay. But uh, laboratory diagnosis for rabies, it happens very late. So it won't help as a public health policy. Increasing the capacity of health workers for surveillance, no, surveillance like uh, it doesn't work for rabies. So basically speaking, which is the best op option over here, eliminating stray dogs and vaccinating all the dogs is one of the best way to prevent rabies at the public health level. It's a direct MCQ, common sense MCQ. The next question is a cohort study was conducted with drinkers and non-drinkers of green tea a very fascinating type of mcq to study its effect on diabetes so very like up to date topic i would say effect of green tea on diabetes a lot of questions we get when we are working in the clinics the risk ratio was found to be 0.85 which of the following statement is correct so what do you want to say the question is talking about the risk ratio the question wants to know that the mcq wala wants to know that do you understand what do you mean by a risk ratio do you know that what is a risk ratio risk ratio also called as a relative risk it is given by the formula incidence in exposed divided by the incidence in non-exposed relative risk or risk ratio is calculated in cohort studies in cohort studies please note that if the relative risk is equal to one it means no association was found and if the relative risk is less than one it means a negative association or a protective effect whatever factor that you were assessing that has a protective effect and on the other hand if the relative risk is more than one it is higher than one that means a positive association or whatever factor you were assessing whatever factor you were assessing that factor is a risk factor and it actually promotes the happening of that particular disease this is the relative risk more than one so the mcq over here says that the relative risk is 0.85 what does it mean it is less than one if it is less than one that means it is a protective effect so now if you understand the options green tea reduces the risk of diabetes mellitus is it protective does it reduce yes it does reduce green tea increases the risk of diabetes mellitus no nah, this is wrong this is false data insufficient to establish causal association may be right or may be wrong but usually we don't assess causal association based on this but yes uh, data insufficient is not correct answer the value 0 0.85 tends to be close to one so there is absurd answer so the best answer over here is a direct answer green tea decreases diabetes mellitus this we understand from the risk ratio and the next mcq is the average life expectancy for a female in japan is 87 years so that's a pretty high life expectancy due to recent advances in testing in cervical cancer for cervical cancer there is an increase in the life expectancy by 15 years so wow that is pretty impressive now the people are going to live till 100 years the healthcare utilization index is 0 0.8 which of the following can be calculated from the parameters so hail dali dfli dfly or quality so please note that <clears throat> what do you mean by HALE? HALE stands for Health Adjusted Life Expectancy. DALI is Disability Adjusted Life Years. QALI is Quality Adjusted Life Years. Whenever the question will talk about DALI, DALI, please note that DALI takes into account two things. It takes into account years lost to life. So it is the number of premature deaths plus it talks about the years lived with disability. YLD, years lived with disability. So it takes both things, disability and life. It is the best measure, best for assessment of the burden of a disease. How bad or how severely the disease may affect the population, that is what is DALI. Next is what is this HAIL? HAIL stands beta for the health adjusted life expectancy it tells you that how healthy the population is it is it is actually the number of years lived in full health lived in full health in the population with respect to like in accordance for or adjusting for adjusting for the ill health or the sickness or disabilities in the years 
so number of years a newborn person is going to live in full health in that particular country based on the endemicity of diseases typhoid cholera tuberculosis cancer so based on all the disease prevalences in the community it is one of the best indicator it is good indicator for the health status health status of a community or of a country or the burden of sickness in a country is given by health no confusions over this okay next another important uh, understanding over here is regarding like what do you mean by the quali beta that is interesting for us to know what is quali quali stands for the quality adjusted life years so it tells you quali tells you what it tells you the effect of an intervention this intervention could be in terms of early screening of disease it could be in terms of early treatment of disease better treatment of disease better rehabilitative care whatever it is so effect of an intervention on a particular disease is given by quali for any disease you can have various intervention which intervention gives the best quality of life to the person so in quali there are two things one is improvement in the quality of life second is there is also improvement in the number of years of life so there is improvement in what improvement in the quality years of life are you understanding it improves treatment with art anti retroviral therapy for hiv will improve the quality of life it will also improve the number of years lived in that by that particular person because that person was taking art so that understanding is called as quali quali is the best measure to find out the effectiveness of an intervention so can you remember this if you understand this now let us come back to the mcq this question is saying that the healthcare utilization rate is 0.8 and there is an increase in the 15 years life expectancy which of the following can be calculated answer is quali so it tells you about the effectivity of an intervention answer best answer over here is best answer over here is quali coming to the next mcq a male patient is diagnosed to be a case of tuberculosis he took complete treatment okay he took complete treatment and the sputum examination done at the end of intensive and the continuation phase that means probably the patient was taking a drug sensitive tb regime was negative what is the state of the status of the person whether you call them as cured treatment completed loss to follow up or loss in treatment so as per the government of india national tb elimination program guidelines there are four important definitions you should know what do you mean by cured treatment completed failure and loss to follow up when do you say a cured cured is any person who whatever it is it has to be sputum positive sputum negative cb not there not there so any person who is a micro biologically confirmed tb case and is sputum negative at end of treatment so if there is a documented proof of sputum negative at the end of treatment that patient is called as cured what do you mean by treatment completed treatment completed is any person who is either clinically diagnosed who could be clinically diagnosed tb case or micro biologically confirmed tb case any person who is extra pulmonary tb or pulmonary tb with clinical diagnosis or with the micro biological diagnosis but no document no document for sputum negative at end of treatment at end of treatment if the, either the patient was not able to get a sputum test done or the document is not available or the sputum test was not done in these cases we are calling them as treatment completed cases so please note that when do you classify a patient as cure classification is if the patient was tb positive sputum positive or microbiologically confirmed in the start and then microbiologically or sputum negative in the end that is cured you know you have cured it otherwise you just say i don't know what was there in the start what was there in the end but we gave the treatment that is a treatment completed when do you say a failure failure is in case of drug sensitive drug resistant it is different definition for your exam you should know that failure is any patient who is sputum positive even at fifth month of the treatment that is called as a sputum failure uh, that is called as a treatment failure even there is a, another part of the definition any person who is sputum positive any time any time after a sputum negative sample 
So in case a patient has any time sputum negative and after one month by chance you do a sputum test it becomes positive any time sputum positive after sputum negative is failure and or, and or if the patient is still sputum positive at fifth month that is also called as failure. What do you mean by loss to follow up? But a loss to follow up is loss to follow up is loss to follow up is if a patient took the treatment for one month the patient has taken treatment for more than one month but with now with interruption interruption now with interruption or the patient has actually defaulted with there is interruption for more than one month this case is called as a loss to follow up so these definitions have been classically given by the ntep national tb elimination program if you understand this definition i think the question is pretty straightforward to you that a pa male patient was diagnosed to be a case of tb uh, case of tuberculosis he took complete treatment and the sputum uh, test is negative sputum test is negative so you have a documented proof that the sputum test is negative so the best answer over here is that this patient is tb cured next question is many children from a particular community coming to a hospital were detected as having all all is acute lymphocytic leukemia so the hospital said that it is probably because of the due to the presence of a cytotoxic waste in the in the water of that community that is an unfortunate event which happened probably in that community in case if a case control study was to be done to find out whether the that the chemical and all they are associated what will be taken as control so very simple to understand you are trying to do a case control study which is a hospital based case control study because it is a hospital based you are talking of a serious disease that is all so what should be your cases the cases will be all cases of all 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 cases common sense now the pro pro question is saying that what are you going to take as control because what do you think is the risk factor and what do you think is the disease if you understand this then the mcq will cause zero confusion if you would have watched my main lectures in in the epidemiology i talked to you about risk factor and disease so beta the disease that you're talking is all the risk factor that you're talking is living in that area or having an exposure are we getting it so you're taking some people with disease yes disease no disease you take people with yes disease no disease and then you try to find out yes risk factor or no risk factor are we okay with this in the in the no disease people you ask about yes risk factor no risk factor are we getting this yes risk factor no risk factor and uh, people with disease or no disease so common sense who is my control control will be any person who is without all are you getting it now if you understand this phenomena let us go back to the mcqs and let's see which option is going to fit into my understanding children option number a i'm going to read beta the children from the area exposed but unaffected that makes does that fit over here from the area exposed can you see that from the exposed area only will you take nonsense then how are you going to do the case control study so this is not possible you don't want from that particular area only children from the area not exposed of course common sense that is all option is not possible children coming to your opd okay children coming to my opd who do not have disease very simple that is my control is there any problem in this so children who come to my opd who do not have disease that will be my control i'll ask them better do you live in this area or that area simple this is what a case control study now this is what is a case control study so another mcq like uh, fourth option all children with all how stupid is this how will you take the control as all irrespective of the exposure that is uh, just a filler option okay so anyways uh, understanding over here is i want to help you inculcate that understanding in your brain you should always see that what is the risk factor and what is the disease then you find out with the same understanding you'd say yes disease no disease yes risk factor no risk factor if you do this i don't think anybody could have caused any confusion in your exam right so anyways all the very best and uh, thank you so much for watching this whole module on the neat exam recall topics and uh, keep on revising and make sure that you study very hard and you will succeed very soon all the very best